Morning, everyone. Morning. Hey, it is so good to see you. If you're a guest this morning, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, so last week, we kicked off this new series. Uh, and we started into this conversation uh, about marriage and relationships. Because we know that if we're going to live out our vision to connect people to Jesus and love our community, uh, we've got to talk about real life stuff. And one of those real life things is marriage and relationships. Uh, we, we kicked off this series uh, talking about how we're building together. And I let everybody know that uh, we have this Ikea queen-sized bed that we are building over the course of this series. Last week we had a box. This week we've got it opened. Uh, we've looked at all the parts. Uh, and so next week when you get here, uh, it's going to begin to take shape. And, and that we're building in this series together. Last week as we started out, we kind of laid the groundwork that uh, marriage is difficult. Marriage is difficult, uh, and if we're not careful, uh, before we know it, the world can begin to define what our marriage looks like uh, more than Jesus can. And we started together talking about how marriage is a picture of the gospel. Marriage is a picture of the gospel, what Jesus does for us, uh, we are to do for our spouse. I, I've brought some earth-shattering things for you this morning. It really, it's just one, and we're about to start with it. Is everybody ready? I mean, it's, it's intense, okay? And you probably have never thought of things this way, but one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for difficulty in marriage is because men and women are different. Uh, there it is, mind blown, worth your price of admission, okay, we're good. Right? Like, there is a huge difference between men and women. And not just physically, but uh, spiritually and emotionally. Emotionally, okay? <laughs> there, are large, <laughs> there are large differences between men and women. And so, as we get ready to talk about some of these differences, but also what God calls us to do within them, it doesn't make sense for me to just explain both parts. Uh, and so this morning, I have brought... Uh, Emily, my wife on stage, uh, to bring light to how both of these aspects that God calls us to, when looking at his instructions for husband and wife, how these fit together. Emily, I know, I know that you are extremely rested, <laughs> that your thoughts are incredibly organized and in their place, and you had a very peaceful morning with the kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. How did your morning go? It was great today. It wasn't that bad. Reagan changed her clothes only twice. And I dragged Levi out of bed, and he only cried for a minute. And Jack has underwear on. And That's a win. And That's Maggie didn't put anything in the toilet. Yep, there you go. So. Perfect. Perfect. This morning when we talk about uh, marriage, when we talk about our marriage, when we talk about relationship between a husband and wife, uh, we want to be real clear is that we don't have all of this figured out and that we are learning as we go just like all of you are. And we have also made plenty of mistakes and still Matt do. has. Right, right. I corrected. Yeah. Um, as we walk through God's word together we're just going to talk about the things that we're learning the things that we've messed up along the way and learned from so far and there are plenty of people in here that have been married way longer than we have and they've been walking with Jesus way longer than we have but we just want to share our perspective since we've been studying this passage um, and just show what God has been teaching us while we've been studying this passage so we don't get an extra dose of happy marriage just because Matt's the preacher right just putting that out there right uh, as we jump in uh, into the middle of this, I want to pray, and then we're going to go. Uh, Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for your church. God, I'm so thankful to uh, have this time where when we sit together, we learn together, we get to worship together. Uh, God, it is a rare experience that this happens, and it only happens once a week. And so, Father, I pray that we cherish uh, the community that we have here, but God, I pray that we also cherish uh, your word. Uh, as not just a suggestion, but as direction for our life, as clarity for our life. Uh, Father, as we, as we talk about the role and the instructions given in your word for a husband and a wife this morning, God, I pray that, we, that our hearts listen, God, that we don't pretend we have it all figured out, but Father, that we will hear what your word teaches us. Father, I pray for the marriages in the room, and God, I pray that you will strengthen and restore 
God, I pray that you will breathe hope into some, that you will bring joy to some. Uh, God, that you will remind uh, both spouses of the value that they have in one another. Father, I pray for those in the room that aren't married, and whether they were for a long time or hoping to be some, someday or someplace in the middle, uh, God, I pray that you will show us the truth in your word uh, of not just how you love us, but what you call us to, because it's there as well, even in these words. Jesus, I'm thankful for, <coughs> I'm thankful for your grace and your mercy, and that as a room full of sinful people who have made mistakes, God, you give us this gift of grace and you invite us closer to you. And because of that, we can sit here this morning with the hope of heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So before we, is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. So before we start talking about um, marriage, we're going to talk about how our marriage started, like our story kind of. So Matt and I met in Joplin. I had gone to school for a couple of years at MACC because I'm a little older than he is. And then um, we met in Joplin at Ozark Christian College. That's, that's how we got <coughs> to know each other. Um, Matt had just been hired as a part-time youth minister at a small church, and I was kind of in charge of the children's ministry side of this little church. <laughs> And from the moment we started working together... She loved me. We hated each other. <laughs> a lot. We hated each other a lot. It was not pretty. Um, mostly because, I don't know if you know much about Matt, but he's kind of loud, which hasn't changed. And he has really strong ideas, and so do I. Our personalities are... I'm also a tad loud. Um... Our personalities are very similar, and so from the get-go, we were butting heads on everything. He would have an idea, and I didn't like it, or I would have an idea, and he wouldn't like it, and it just wasn't pretty. <laughs> but then, after a couple of years, um, we worked in a... The community that we worked in was pretty <coughs> poverty-stricken, and we had a lot of kids without parents at our church, and so we wanted to do something for the community to kind of bring them in so that we could meet them. So we... Um, planned a car show, which I know nothing about, <laughs> and neither did Matt, but we planned a car show and a carnival, and Matt's really good at events, and so we kind of teamed up together and planned this out, and it just clicked. We just started working together so well, and, um, and it went really well. The event went well, and I started learning more about Matt, about how he felt about Jesus, which I never really talked to him about before then. <laughs> um, and I started learning about how he loved the church, and I loved the church. And then after a while, I couldn't imagine doing anything without him, not just working in the church. Just I just wanted to be with him all the time. So Bingo. That's how it started. <laughs> um, and I think that is what Paul is talking about. When he talks about the roles of marriage, he talks about how um, they're a team, about how it works when both people are fulfilling their roles. And um, I think that's kind of a good picture of, of what Paul is setting us up to learn. You forgot when you realized how good looking I was. Right. Yeah, okay. If you brought a Bible this morning, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, this is where uh, we were at the tail end of Ephesians chapter 5 last week. Uh, and we're going to read the words that kind of precede that. Uh, Paul, as he writes this letter to this church in Ephesus, uh, what he is reminding them of, he's reminding them about how their identity in Jesus, how it is supposed to and designed to collide with every aspect of their life. And so it's not just, hey, you're a follower of Jesus when you're at church, but it's, hey, your identity as a Jesus follower impacts every area of your life. And one of the main areas uh, in our lives is in our family, in our home, and for many of us, it's in our marriage. And so if, if Paul is teaching and talking as he writes this letter to this church about, hey, this is what your identity as a follower of Jesus looks like here and here and here, he would be remiss if he did not bring up marriage. Because it's such a big deal when it comes to following Jesus and the way that your spouse affects that. And some of us have stories that are incredible stories of how it was affected. And some of us have horrible stories about how it was affected. But we, we can see that the way that we relate to Jesus and the way we follow Jesus, our identity in Jesus, impacts our relationship with our spouse. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to begin reading in verse 21. 
Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands, to your own husbands, as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, after all. And no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. As Paul is reminding these people, this is, as a Jesus follower, this is how it works in your home. There's one word that concerns Paul more than anything else. And if you're paying attention, you heard it several different times as I was reading. But for a lot of us, we may be cringed when we heard that word. We don't like this word. It's not a fun word. And for, for some of us, it's a really difficult word. Emily, what is that word? Submit. Submit. Why don't we like the word submit? Because no one likes to be told what to do. Right. Kind of like that time I told you that I was going to put my resume in and we were going to move to Macon, right? Right. Right. Yeah. You weren't a fan of that? No. I no. Was not. No. Even though it was your home church? Yeah. Yeah. We made it work. Yeah. You see, before Paul, before Paul gets into husbands and wives... There is something that's crucial for us to see together. Before he ever says wives or husbands, he says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this is key, friends. This is is a monumental verse when it comes to the role of husbands and wives because it begins here. Following Jesus requires us submitting first to him, which is fine for so many of us until it begins to affect our comfort, right? Right? Like, yeah, I love going to church. It's good to hang out with people. You know, we get a donut and we get coffee. Hey, we need you to sacrifice your time. Whoa, wait a minute. Following and submitting to Jesus is okay until it begins to affect our comfort. And what we can't miss is before we are to step into the role of a husband or step into the role of a wife, that we must first submit to Jesus. And I need to say that if right now, no matter how long we've been married or not married, if we're trying to figure out how to be a good husband or how to be a good wife and we're neglecting how we can be a better follower of Jesus, then we are already neglecting how to be a better husband or wife. Because the better follower of Jesus that you are, the more equipped you are to be a husband and a wife. The more that you learn the character of Jesus, the more you become And live in the character of Jesus. And so we can't just say, I want to be a good husband or I want to be a good wife. And then neglect the following Jesus part. Because both roles are going to be more difficult if we're not first submitting to Jesus. You see, the more we submit to Jesus, the better of a spouse we will become. Because submission, a lot of times we read this and we're like, oh, well, it's the wife's job to submit. Submission is for both of us because of our love for Jesus. And then we take the step into the instructions. And instructions are hard, aren't they? Like I, I opened this bed this week, and I started looking at the instructions of how to put this together. And first of all, there's some really goofy illustrations on the front page. That distracted me. But then there's all of these pieces, 40 of this and 22 of this and A1 meets B12 and this size screw and this peg here and all of these other things. And I'm like, whoa. See, instructions sometimes are difficult. And so when we sometimes read the instructions, we're like, I can't figure this out. I can't do this. Some of us, guys, I'm not pointing at us, but some of us are just going to say, I don't need the instructions. I'll figure it out. And a lot of times that doesn't work. Some of us just give up. Or some of us just 
walk away. For the instructions for husband and wife to work, it begins with both of us submitting to Jesus. But then, then we take the step together. And Paul, Paul tells wives what to do here. Since I don't want to tell wives what to do. Emily, what is Paul teaching us here when it comes to wives? Oh, I really like to tell people what to do as well. Um, I'm just aware. kidding. I mean, I, whatever. Okay. Um, <laughs> when I read this for the first time, no. All the time when I read this, um, I feel like I need to address the word submit because I don't like it. I don't like it. I, I don't like the way it feels to hear it. Um, it's a hard word. I wanted to know exactly what it meant because of the way this word is perceived by the world, especially by women right now. Um, there are movements all over the world that scream against women being under submission in any form, especially a woman submitting to a man. And to some extent, I understand, because women are mistreated all over the world every day, and they should be defended, and they should be um, stood up for, and that should happen, and that should happen by the church. Um, they should be protected, but that's not what we're dealing with here. That's not what, what Paul is asking women to do. They're not asking, he's not asking women to be um, mistreated. The word here means to arrange under, um, to subject oneself and to yield. Now, my personality is not a yielding personality, okay? I don't like to. I do not like to. I don't want to be uh, under someone else's charge. I, I want to be in charge of my own self. Um, and when I think about this, we're having someone say um, that Matt is in charge of me. That's what Paul is saying. He is in charge of me. And my first reaction is to not like it. Uh, I know you're shocked, but I really do like to be in charge. I don't even like to use the word authority when we're talking about marriage. But that really made me stop and think when I started studying this. I had a lot of negativity coming up when I started studying it. And it made me stop and think, why don't I like it? Why do I feel that way? And I think it's because I've taken the word submission and the word inferior and I've linked them together and made them make the same, have the same definition. And that's not what Paul is teaching us here. Just because I'm submitting to Matt doesn't mean that I'm inferior to him. Paul isn't telling women that their wives are smarter than, or that their husbands are smarter than their wives, or more important than their wives, or better than their wives. That's not what he's saying. They're leading their wives. And this is really key to understanding the scripture. Um, I want you to picture a football team. <laughs> there you go, Karen. A football team. Um, Emma's super sporty. I'm not. Okay, so I know this might come as a shock, but ESPN is on at my house regularly. And I don't watch it, but I'm not deaf. And so I pick up a lot of things that it says. Um, and a lot of times right now, I hear about teams who are firing their coaches like every year. Like they have a new coach every year. Not just football, like all these teams. And I think it's ridiculous. But then I, because you have a team of like 50 guys and they're prime athletes, they're trained, they're strong, they're ready to compete and sport and they're millionaires because they're so good at what they do but they lose right they lose and always people say it's the coach and why do they say that because the coach is the leader the coach is supposed to be the one who knows the strengths and weaknesses of the players they're supposed to know what goes well for them and how they should be used and how their talent should be utilized and if they're not doing it right then they lose and that is a good picture of what marriage is in this text, I think. Um, the team needs someone to lead who knows their strengths and their weaknesses. 
We are a team. Matt and I are a team. Our goal is to glorify God with what we've been given. Matt is in charge of making sure that that's carried out. My job is to look to him and follow him in that. And if he thinks that something is good for our family, then I am supposed to trust him in that. That is what submission is. <coughs> and it isn't conditional. It doesn't mean that I trust him until I think that it isn't a good idea. It doesn't mean that I trust him until he makes me mad. Not that he makes me mad. Never. It doesn't mean that I trust him until I think that my idea is better. I look to him and follow him because he's the coach. God has set him up to be the leader. And that means that I will do my best to trust his judgment with how he handles our family. I won't make him prove himself to me before I trust him, before I follow his lead. I won't make my own plans when I disagree with him, mostly because I know he'll ask me how I feel about them before, before he makes the plans. Um, and I won't rip him to shreds every time he makes a mistake like I was expecting him to fail. That's what submission looks like. That's what biblical submission looks like. Um, you've seen examples of teams that don't win because everyone's trying to be in charge. And what happens? They lose. Not just a sports team, any team. If a team doesn't have a united goal that they're working toward, it doesn't work. They lose. Um, we can't both go our own way. We can't both have our own agendas for our marriage. And Jesus is all about unity. That's not a united way to live. If we both have different ideas about how our marriage should go, it's not going to work. We have to fall under one united uh, goal. And please don't think that I'm saying that I lose my identity while submitting to my husband because the text does not say that. It does not say that I forget who God has created me to be. Uh, I don't lose my personality or my passions or my purpose because, because, God is, because Matt is my leader. That's not what it says. And that is not what submission is. It's telling Matt that I trust him with our family. I trust him with myself, with our well-being. And this pleases God because that's what he's asked us to do. As Emily has given wives a picture of submission, guides, guys, if we want to change the perception of submission, then we have to change the perception of leadership, or as Paul says, the head. And before we get too far ahead of ourselves in all of our male arrogance about what Paul is telling us that we are to be, let us keep in mind that we had our shot. Like, we were, we were in the garden, we were by ourselves, God made us first, and we couldn't make it more than a couple days of naming animals before God looked at us and be like, ah, they need some help. <laughs> All right? So let's not get too far ahead of ourselves and too confident, be like, oh, the head, the leader. No, no. It was not more than a couple days before God realized we needed some help. When Paul calls husbands to be the head or to be the leader, he is not talking about boss, dictator, or ruling authority. And part of the reason that there is such a misunderstanding of submission, like Emily mentioned, is because, guys, in all of our male pride, we have warped the idea of leadership that God is calling us to. And here's what's key as what Paul is writing. Is, guys, leadership is not a task to complete. It is, it is a design that we live in. It's not a task to complete. It's a design that God has placed inside of us. That deep in our DNA, he has placed leadership qualities in order to live in his design. And I know what some of you are thinking because I know some of you. And you think, Matt, wait a minute. That's not me. I'm not a leader. I'm not an up in front of people guy. I'm not rallying the troops. I'm not getting up and giving any speech at all. I don't want to make all the decision. That's not my personality. And you're right. 
you're right. For some of us, it's not our personality. But Paul is not calling us and reminding us of our leadership in front of a crowd. When Paul writes these words, he's not, he's not saying, hey, you're the, you're the leader, and so you need to get up in front of a whole bunch of people. That's not the leadership that Paul is speaking to. Paul is not calling us to a crowd, but to a family. And it's not a life of being in charge. It's a life of being an example. I mean, we talk all the time. We talk all, all the time about following Jesus' example, right? Like, we'll, we'll study something uh, in Jesus' life. Together, we'll look at how Jesus loved uh, the people that most of society wanted to kick out. Like we'll talk about how Jesus loved the leper or the blind or the woman caught in adultery and how he, he, he cared for them and he talked with them when society just wanted to kick them out. We learn about Jesus' example and the challenge is to go and be like that example. Like We, we see how Jesus uh, teaches the people that are following him, the disciples, and we want to live in that example. We see the example of Jesus, and then we want to become like that example. And this is the leadership that Paul is talking about for husbands, is that we are to be an example. We are designed to be examples in our home. Good question, guys. If our wife follows our leadership, does she get closer to Jesus? If, if our kids, if they follow our leadership and our example, do they learn who Jesus is? Now, one of the misconceptions when I say that is that for guys, we immediately go to, oh, man, that means... I mean, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be the Jesus leader in my household, that means that I need to sit at the table with a coffee cup and read the Bible twenty four seven. And whenever my wife or kids come in the room, I pray for them out loud, and that's just my life. And that's so far from the truth. That's so far from what Paul is calling us to. When it comes to us being an example and to be the leader, it is this rugged, courageous, warrior type mentality that we are to have for our homes. That we are to have for our wives, that we are to have for our kids and our wives' relationship with Jesus. Because let's be honest, it's a whole lot easier to come home from work and check out and drink our dinner than it is to engage with our kids and to remind our spouse why they have value every single day. That's not an example. You see, Paul is calling us as men to engage as examples As warriors fighting, not with our home, but for our home. And that when things get difficult, we will be the stopgap. When things get hard, we will be peace. When there is a storm, we will be calm. Because we're the leader of our home. We're the example in our home. The head of the wife in a household, it means that when someone cuts cuts us off in traffic and our whole family is in the car... They don't learn everything that they normally learn in the back of the bus in that moment. To be the head of our home, it means that our kids see our wife laugh more than they see her cry. To be the head of our home, it means that we make sure that our kids pray before they go to bed. And when they don't know how to, we don't say, I don't either. But we courageously try. To be the head of our house, it means that when we teach our boys to hunt or play sports, that we also teach them to give credit to God for their talents and their abilities, and not just puff up a male ego that's growing. To be, to be the leader of our home, it doesn't mean that we make all the money. It doesn't mean that we make the most money sometimes. But it does mean that we make sure that our money honors God. To be the leader of our home, it means that sometimes we say no, even when it's difficult, to target trips. Because we know it's not what is best in that moment. To be the leader of our home, it means that we put Jesus first in our schedule. And we put our spouse first in our schedule. 
You see, Paul equates our instructions to leader to what Jesus did. And he says, I mean, he tells us what Jesus did. Like he loved and cared for the church and he gave his life up for her. In other words, Jesus equals sacrifice. And to be the leader of our home and to be the head of our home, we sacrifice anything and everything, not just to make our wife happy. And hear that, both men and ladies. But guys, we sacrifice anything and everything to make sure our wives are who God designed them to be. And if something that we want to do or something that seems like a priority pulls them further away from who God designed them to be or pulls them further away from God's design for your marriage, then we don't do it, guys. If what we want to do, if what we want to do pulls our wife away from Jesus, then we do not do it. And sometimes that's hard. But as the leader and as the head, we courageously say no. Because if I could be so frank, if we want our wives to submit, then we need to be Christian leaders worth submitting to. Leader doesn't equal dominance, and submission does not equal inferior. As a leader, as a leader, who we value shows the depth of our leadership, even in our home. Who we value shows the depth of our leadership. If, if we're going to lead our home, then we have to value our wife. We have to value her opinions, her designs. We have to value her passions and her interests. We have to value who God made her to be as an individual. We have to value our kids and the investment that we are placing in them. And one of the biggest things that we can do for our kids is to give them a healthy marriage to watch. Because let's be honest, guys. Why would anyone want to submit and follow someone that doesn't value them? You see, these roles, these roles are designed to work together. They're designed to fit together, kind of like a puzzle, which is why Emily mentioned a team. Submission and leadership, they're, they're designed, they're, they're built into us by God because they are meant to fit together. Guys, the more boldly that we lead, the more courageously we fight for our wives as the leaders of our home, the easier it is for them to submit to our leadership. And ladies, the more that you practice submission to your husband, the easier it becomes for them to lead. You see, these instructions that Paul gives, they're not just to give us a happy home, because it's not always happy. But here's the truth for this morning. Instructions bring definition to God's design for marriage. Instructions bring definition to God's design for marriage. They bring clarity to God's design for marriage. So Emily and I, we both wear glasses. Right now we're wearing contacts. We're not just blind up here. Okay. But we both wear glasses. And these glasses are Emily's glasses. They look good, don't they? On me? Yeah, yeah, they do. And Emily has my glasses on. Hey. And you can look at either of us and say, eh, I don't know, especially me. Like if I showed up on a Sunday and be like, oh, you like my new glasses? All oh, you're lying to me, okay, <laughs> if you say yeah. I know that. Because they're not for me. They're not designed for me. In the same way my glasses are not designed for Emily. When, when, I, when I look through these glasses that are made for Emily and her prescription and the way that she is built, guess what? I can't see. I can't see what's right next to me. I can't see what's right in front of me. I can't see because they're not designed for me. The same way when Emily looks through my glasses, she can't see what's right next to her clearly. She can't see what is around her. Because they're not designed for her. Contacts and glasses are intense. You all are really blurry right now. Woo! <laughs> but here's the most important thing that you can't see. 
If you're wearing something that is not built for you, if you're wearing something that is not designed for you, you can't see who you're following. But right now, if a couple people in the back row got up and they said, hey, Matt, follow me. Okay. I can't see who's standing up. I can't see where I'm supposed to go because it's not designed for me. I can't see who I am following. And this, this is what Paul is teaching us. That we are to live in these instructions and in these designs because they're built for us. And when I put on what was designed for me, all of a sudden there is clarity. When I put on what was designed for me, now there is direction. When I put on what was designed for me, and when she does that with her, now both of us can see clearly. If you want to create tension and frustration in your marriage, then start standing in each other's roles. And some of you have war stories from that. Because they're not designed for us. And it has nothing to do with dominance and inferior. It has to do with being followers of Jesus. And living in the instructions and the design that he has given each of us. We see things from different perspectives. We're designed differently. We're given different roles. But they're designed to draw us closer, not further apart. And so I guess maybe here's our question. If submission begins with following Jesus and leadership begins with following Jesus, and before we can do either of those, we have to follow Jesus, maybe the best question is not how we're doing with our role, but how we're doing it following Jesus. And this is true whether we're married or not. If you're single and just living it up and loving it, the question is still, how are you following Jesus? If you were married for a whole bunch of years and now you're not, the question is still, how are you following Jesus? And right now, if you are married, Before we can be leader or before we can be helper, we have to be follower. And so this morning, as hard as the instructions are, if we're going to get through them, we have to be followers first. Because instructions bring definition to God's design. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much, and we thank you for this time, and we thank you that we're able to gather here together. Um, I pray that you will give us insight and wisdom about how to fulfill the roles of marriage that you've put in the Bible for us. Thank you for giving them to us, and I pray that you will help us to be obedient and humble enough to follow your rules. I pray that you will um, be with us in our marriages and just with our walk with you. Um, help please just make yourself known to us so that we can do a good job following you i pray that you will bless us and keep us in jesus name i pray amen why don't we go ahead and stand together (coughs) we're gonna spend some time spend some time worshiping focusing on who it is that we're following for some of us we hear I need to be a follower of Jesus before I can be a husband or a wife. I think, yeah, I've not really done that. And I'm I'm trying to do this wife thing or I'm trying to do this husband thing, but man, I've, I've not really done the Jesus thing. And so maybe as we worship, some of us, we say, man, I, I need to give my life to Jesus before I can be the spouse that I need to be. And maybe today's the day that you do that. Maybe, maybe for some of us, Maybe for some of us in the room that are married, we recognize, man, I've been trying to stand in their shoes because it's more fun to lead than to submit sometimes. And on the contrary, sometimes it's easier just to submit and go along with it than to stand up and lead. Maybe for some of us, our our marriages, they they don't point to Jesus right now. They don't get us closer to him. Guys, for some of us, maybe our leadership does not lead our wife and kids closer to Jesus. And ladies, for 
some in the room, maybe the way that submission is taking place or not taking place leads us further away from Jesus. And so maybe this morning as we worship, you say, you know what? Today's the day that I'm going to lead. Today's the day that I'm going to help instead of control. Today's the day that I'm going to live in the instruction and the design that God has given us. Because they bring definition to God's design. And I always want to live in God's design. (laughs) Maybe for some of us, we say, you know what? My marriage is, is not in a good spot. For lots of different reasons and for some that I don't even know anymore. But my marriage is not in a good spot. Our relationship is not good right now. We're fighting all the time. We're arguing all the time. There's no joy. And so maybe this morning as we worship, it's not singing and it's not thinking because you think all the time about it. Maybe this morning as we worship, you just need someone to pray for you. And during this time, there's some in the back, and Emily and I are up front. And maybe hey, you just need to say, listen, we need, we need somebody to pray. To pray hope into our relationship. To remind us of the value that we find in one another. And not just all the things we need to do. And so maybe during this time of worship, we recognize and we boldly step out and say, I need someone to stand with me. Because right now I feel like everything's against me. Friends, as we worship this morning, the instructions that Paul gives us, they begin with submitting to Jesus. They are followed by living in the design that he has created us to be. This morning as we worship, whether it's in our design or in our submission, how well are we following? Let's sing.